There is an unspoken yet totally known rule of animation. Season 2 is the real first season of the show. Sure, this is probably true to an extent for live action, but we're not talking about that, are we? Almost like clockwork, if you like a first season of a show, but feel like there's a lot of room for growth in terms of humor or plot or characters, season two will come around and blast your balls off and give you everything you wanted and more. I can only think of a handful of times where a season one was so good and so unique that the second season actually felt less special. I love Centaur World dearly, but the first season is peak. The second season, barring literally the final episode, was still a lot of fun, but wasn't up to snuff. Adventure Time, being so innovative and unrestrained and unlike anything else on TV in 2010, could have easily gone that way too. A neat experiment that fell to the wayside. But it did it. Oh no, like any good season two, what we got this time was the real Adventure Time. For good and for ill. Where was I at the time that season two aired? That period of late 2010 into 2011? Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver came out that year, and because of that, I met some of my closest friends to this day. Literally, one day in study hall, I saw a kid shaking a Pokewalker, and I, traumatized by being bullied and called gay in middle school for liking Pokemon still, spoke up and made some dumb quip I can't remember. Are you kidding me? Not much a To this day, me and that guy watch cartoons in the break room at our job. Hell, that kid introduced me to another kid who was actually gay. In my 15-year-old estimation, the two kind of reminded me of Beavis and Butthead, and that brought me some extra kind of comfort. Needless to say, for the first time in a long time, I felt comfortable sharing my interests with other male teenagers, talking about Pokemon and Nintendo games and shit. I think for that reason, though, it took me a while to actually bring up Adventure Time. It was my favorite thing at the moment, and the idea of any kind of rejection after finally finding a niche was horrifying. Not to mention, I had a lot more pressing personal baggage at the time. A grandparent I was very close to passed away that year. And Adventure Time was one of the few things keeping me sane. Fuck no, was I going to spoil my fun in my happy place by asking teen boys what they thought of this weird, nerdy crap I'm into? Well, turns out my worrying was for nothing. We'll get back to my friends later in this video, but what I mean is, yeah, holy shit, season two of Adventure Time is a total banger. Even a soulless teenager like myself would have to admit that much after watching it. It was everything the first season was, but more. Season one is more iconic, but this one is just a ridiculous density of some of the funniest and most creative and complex episodes of the whole series. So come along with me, friends. It's part two of Adventure Time Time. Starting off with what was changed, it's not much, but it's also pretty substantial. Lots of new reoccurring characters and gags, some of which go on to be just as important or more so than those introduced the last season. I mean, Marceline only got two episodes last season, but was clearly a character of great interest and import to the writers, so not only did she come back, she got the season premiere. Into the Nightosphere signified in my brain that season one wasn't just a fluke and that all that inner complexity just beyond the silly surface was real. It feels like the first real character-focused deep dive that isn't just Finn or Jake, too. Besides, of course, maybe Princess Bubblegum or Ice King a few times in Season 1. Establishing Marceline as a sympathetic or vulnerable character after she was purely a slightly bullish punk girl last season leaves a great first impression. Plus, this episode being at the start of the season leads into another point I'll get into later. In general, the tone feels a lot more focused and punchy. I don't want to call it cynical, necessarily, but it definitely has a stronger bite this time around. Episodes like Power Animal come to mind, with Finn being brutally tortured by little freaks as a funny B plot, and then the A plot is Jake just kind of fucking around before he comes and saves him. Finn just really goes through the ringer in this season. I know fans make fun of Finn for being a little beta cuckboy in later seasons, but that has always been the case and gets its start here. Like, to cut a girl's hair, you have him making a complete ass out of himself to a bunch of ladies and generally being a huge cringe lord. 
It's funny, though, because they got Throat Van Orman to voice the old, ugly tree witch. On that note, it's interesting to me how many iconic moments also come from this season. Usually when you think of shows, the first season takes precedence as the most iconic one, but things like Finn's long hair and Hunson Abadir and the Fry song and that whole episode, the Lich, all these other stuff that I will get around to at a later point in this video, all gets its start here. It's just really cool that the show was still firing on all cylinders and capturing people's imaginations even after they had their open salvo in the first season. You don't get that very often. Speaking of cringe lords, though, me. I have a habit of trying to rope in all of my friends into having the same interests as me. This began well before I even had more than one friend. My single friend throughout all of middle school had to sit by as I sat at his computer and showed him every single Homestar Runner cartoon in existence. Later, when I made more friends in high school, I would do the same thing, but with like I don't know, YouTube poops or whatever else. The screen is full of dumb shit to avoid. However, when I tried to get them on board for Adventure Time, they reacted the way that you might imagine a teen boy would, calling it gay. Its cutesy art style and quirky humor just wouldn't click with a brand of teens that didn't really care enough to care about anything new. It really sucked, to be honest, going out on a limb and sharing something I loved with this new group of kids especially when they made me feel normal again for liking things like cartoons and Pokemon and the Super Nintendo, etc. In a way, it was my greatest fear come true, a personal hell of my own creation, if you will. I knew, though, deep down, the show was awesome enough to convert them. Season 1 was fantastic, but the training wheels were off for Season 2. It felt so much more wild and awesome and hilarious to boot. If I could just get them to see the way that I see... Maybe they'd understand. Even watching now, the season still feels really fresh. I think because I was obsessed with season one and repeatedly watched every single episode that when season two came to the stage, I was supremely ready for it. It felt almost sacred. Getting more adventure time? I feel a similar way about certain games. The excitement was so high when I began that I still have this residual hype all these years later. It also began to just really experiment with the format and tone of the series in a way that wasn't done before, and I think we have Adam Mudo and Rebecca Sugar's work to thank for that. As I alluded to before, you really couldn't get a better start to the season than Into the Nightosphere. Hey everyone, editing Wyatt here. Uh, for some reason, I kept calling this episode Into the Nightosphere, like Into the Spider-Verse, instead of It Came from the Nightosphere, which I had written down but probably because Spider-Verse is on my mind, I just kept fucking it up, and uh, I didn't catch it until, like, re-watching the video as I'm editing it, so, like, I don't know, you guys are just gonna have to deal with it, I don't feel like re-recording the lines, and, uh, certainly putting this big stupid notice in the middle of the video is, is a much better way of solving the problem than just, like, fixing the lines. It just elevated the world and characters in a way that the series basically had never done to that point. Marceline's dad is not only hilarious, but genuinely the biggest threat they'd ever faced and kind of fucking terrifying. Him and the Lich do a great job bookending the season, but we'll get to the Lich a little bit later. You know it's a Mudo and Sugar episode if there's a quirky but sincere song that makes you feel ways about stuff. Everyone already loved Marceline's song in season one, and the one in this episode really came out swinging. Probably just as iconic, if not more so, than the one from season one. I think the only other Marceline-related song that's anywhere near as iconic as this is the one from season eight. You know, the, the let's go in the garden, what everything stays, that one. Because it, it's related to what's-her-face from Steven Universe, what the fuck's her name? The Mickey Mouse? What's her? Spinel! That's it, that's it, yeah, because it's related to Spinel, and people fucking lost their minds to Spinel when the Stevie Universe movie came out. Anyway, back to the script. I want to give a special mention to probably my favorite episode of the season, Susan Straw. Another Mudo and Sugar Joint, and it really floored me when I first saw it, and it kind of still did all these years later. There have been touching or sad moments in the series before, but nothing quite as oddly profound as this. The premise alone is fantastic. Finn and Jake find a clan of sewer barbarians that they believe are humans and take their leader to the surface and slowly start to befriend her, show her the ropes. The episode begins with 
probably for the first time, a spotlight on how alone Finn truly is in this world, being the only human. The song Finn sings in the episode is the first time the series actually made me cry. Nowadays, I'm a huge softie, but as a 16-year-old, impressive stuff. It gave me that peek into the massive, massive potential the show had somehow still not tapped into that I began to really crave. And I think it was that potential that was my in, my secret weapon against my new friends. They may have thought Adventure Time was gay, probably just because they didn't care about it rather than hating it, but they liked me, so when I was able to show how beautiful or surprising or fun these moments were with them, then it began to click. Maybe not in the same level of passion as me, but I was able to rub off on them in that way. Even if they weren't as passionate as a bunch of retro game nerds, we all would mark out to things like Guardians of Sunshine, probably the first really experimental or gimmicky episode of the series, though I don't use that word as a pejorative. It was so ahead of its time that I forgot it was even in this season, and I had assumed it was like season 4 or 5. While the game itself is very much an Atari-style thing, when they go into the game, the low-poly aesthetic was probably the first time that kind of intentionally shitty CGI had been done in a show to evoke nostalgia, and it looked fantastic. I grew up on the tail end of the PS1 and N64, so to me that was nostalgia, not Atari or even the NES. I feel like the finale of the season encompasses the peak and almost the ultimate endpoint of my obsession with Adventure Time as a kid. I mentioned in the previous video, but I was a fastidious little chubby boy and constantly poked around the net for as much behind the scenes info and bits of trivia I could find for Adventure Time, Pen Ward, or everything even tangentially related to the show, including all of the storyboard artists. I was intimately familiar with people like Adam Mudo and Rebecca Sugar before Rebecca Sugar got Steven Universe as a show. Among all that internet ephemera was the show Bible, a fairly normal artifact to cartoon nerds today, but then it felt like the Bible, like I was reading the Dead Sea Scrolls or some shit, especially the entry on what was the ultimate bad guy of the show, the Lich, known as the Lich King at the time. He was described as not being funny in any way, and the show would morph around him and become more dire and serious with his mere presence. Before the season 2 finale, the only time that he popped up in the show was during the Billy song on season 1. I just about lost my shit at that, but I reserved myself. I knew that they probably wanted to hold off on revealing him in true until later. Well, dear viewers, when I learned the finale of season 2 was going to be all about the Lich, and that it was a two-parter, I just about creamed my fucking jorts. Mortal Folly and Mortal Recoil not only managed to fully deliver on a story on a scale that had yet to be seen for Adventure Time, but it still managed to keep its Adventure Time spirit while doing so. It is a two-parter, but they managed to still make them stand out on their own and tell two different types of stories. One, a heroic clash with ultimate evil in which love triumphs, and another that's a big parody of The Exorcist, with a bunch of silly gags culminating in a giant monster fight. Perfect. I couldn't ask for anything better. One character I really haven't talked about a lot is the Ice King. I felt like the Ice King was in top form this season. Honestly, the Nice King episode and the Ice Ninja episodes maybe were the hardest I laughed at any point during watching the show. They started to move him from kooky old man to a kind of depressing loser and a genuine maniac that's maybe a little bit scary. In Mortal Folly, he's kind of just a pain in the ass and always getting in the way to the point where even me, a huge Ice King fan, was getting pretty overwhelmed. Then, when the Lich is first defeated, the Ice King absentmindedly drops Princess Bubblegum into a well of dark magic and sets off the plot for part two. In that, after the Lich Bubblegum goes totally mad, it's the Ice King that has to save the day. I love when stories have the hero be the least expected person, but then also have it make sense. Okay, I didn't kill her this time. Everybody saw that, right? Also, just a small side note, the final moment in the episode always makes me laugh. It's good to know that the Ice King isn't that much of a creep. Basically, the finale gave me everything I thought I wanted, and then a bunch of stuff I didn't even know I wanted. It felt like there was some kind of stakes to the world that they were creating, that just beyond the silly veneer of ad hoc fantasy gags and indie comics vibes, 
There was now some kind of considered world being slowly revealed. It seems so quaint now, especially when you compare it to something like even the season one finale of CB Universe, let alone what happens next in that show. But at the time, it felt like Adventure Time was rapidly evolving into this huge epic story right before our eyes. And of course, a special mention to the Lich himself. Holy shit, dude, I love this guy. Even to this day, he stands out as one of my favorite cartoon baddies of all time. His presence really does morph the show. He's so cool and creepy, and a lot of that comes from the amazingly subtle performance by Ron Perlman. Plus, his design is so cool. I like his more cartoony skeleton look in the beta design, but the whole wretched corpse angle is so much more menacing and ill-fitting for the show. Like, his presence is so effective because it feels like he's invading a show that he doesn't belong in. Huh. Come to think of it, the Nowhere King from Centaur World was exactly the same way, and, and he's also a goat cartoon villain as well. I mean, obviously Centaur World was influenced by Adventure Time in many ways, but that specific element of him being an unwanted corruption to the fun times must be intentional. God, I gotta make another Centaur World video soon. Anyway, if all of that wasn't enough, the episode ending with the teaser that he was still alive inside the background snail was perfect. Now, something that was just a cute Easter egg for two seasons has been turned into a fucking jump scare, some 2012 era, when you see it, you will shit bricks type thing. It's great. I love this show. But that being said, I do have mixed feelings about the actual ending, though that will probably be better saved for the season three video. I do have some season two specific problems that I feel like I should address though, and some lingering problems from season one. While I think overall the direction the season went was for the best and paid off, there is a part of me that still kind of misses that pure charm of season one. I admit, it's probably just nostalgia and over-familiarity with those old episodes, but something definitely feels different even now, watching them back to back all these years later. That being said, the episodes still have a tendency to kind of just end. Now, I don't think every cartoon needs a moral or a lesson, but I think you can steer a ship to port without moralizing. It's definitely not a big issue at all, but it's starting to form cracks in the facade of the world ever so slightly, daily and nightly, especially since, like I said before, the world and the characters and everything that they were building up, it felt like it started to really matter, like you're really now supposed to pay attention to everything that's happening, and I think that that can bite them in the ass in certain ways. The more coherent and realized the world is, and the more of an emotional anchor you have to the characters and the slowly evolving plot, something's bound to give when 75% of the episodes end on an off-color joke. Again, want to clarify, I don't think it's an actual issue yet, and I find pretty much all of these episodes very funny, including their endings. But I can see this philosophy causing some problems in the future. Ironic, considering I think the finale itself has a greatly satisfying ending, despite being a setup for season three, and then that specific thing they set up being endemic of a problem later in that season, and, you know, basically for the rest of the show going forward. I think that's all I got for season two. It was a blast from start to finish, but at the cost of some of what made season one special, still though, I managed to hook in my friends into my cartoon obsession thanks to it. While they never really kept up with Adventure Time, we had a good time watching other shows that were airing around the same time, and to this day, like I said, me and one of my friends continued the tradition of watching cartoons on my laptop, just this time we're doing it on company time in the break room <laughs> instead of in my bedroom. Season 3, though, is going to be interesting. In ways, it was a lot more exciting and more awesome than Season 2, but in others, it kind of ended my love affair with Adventure Time and the idea of me considering it my favorite show. Well, at least until Season 4 rolled around, I guess, but we'll get there. How will I feel now as an adult revisiting it, though? Time will tell, and hopefully this next one won't take so damn long for me to make. Wow, how long has it been? Like... 
what, 18 months? I don't even fucking know how long it's been since I did part one of this, but I'm back on track. I'm making videos. I'm watching Adventure Time. I'm taking notes. I'm doing all that good stuff. Thank you all so much for watching this. I know it's been a long time since the first one, but just thank you for staying interested in this series. I promise you it's going somewhere. That <laughs> It's going to be good. The further we get, once we get to like season four and five, uh, then the, the the true nature of the series will reveal itself. But thank you so much for listening to this one. It was fucking awesome going back through season two and getting an excuse to watch all of those episodes. They're so good. It's so good. Go and watch. If you don't have HBO Max, which I don't blame you for not having it because it's evil, just go and buy buy that big DVD set. You know, it's fucking awesome. The Enchiridion shaped one. It's so cool. Just, like, get that, plop those in, even if it's DVD quality, whatever. Just watch through those episodes. It makes it, it's like when I watched it on digital cable in 2010. So, like, there you go, nostalgia. Uh, but make sure to subscribe if you haven't, and check out my Patreon if you want to see videos like this a week early, and if you want to check out all of the podcasts that I've been doing there. So, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you in the next video, which probably won't be season three of Adventure Time, but that is it won't take that long, I promise. It's going to come soon. All right, see ya.